Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take the global stories that made it to the front pages of our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayori University, Kano. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. As always, thank you. All right, so let's start with the business NG this morning. And the business NG leads with inflation alert. December festivities may worsen Nigeria's woes or Nigeria's economic woes. So, of course, inflation is about 20-something, 20 28% or so, um, uh, well, currently, and it may worsen in December due to the festivities because what is being said that a lot of people are going to be buying, um, people are going to be spending a lot due to the festive period, and of course, there are predictions that inflation may just even worsen. So if we think that we're facing anything right now, well, in a few months, it might just be worse. I want to get your take on this, please. Yeah, you see, one thing with us Nigerians is that uh, we lack festivities. Uh, despite the difficulties that we are in, mm -hmm. once it is festive time, you see people will go down, uh, you know, to the bottom of their pockets, uh, you know, to take, to take every cobble that they have and spend it on the... Uh, you know, uh, the festivities. And this uh, will create a demand. And uh, coupled with the fact that, you know, our business people sometimes, or in most cases, they tend to react to, uh, you know, the demand of people. And uh, so that is why there is likelihood that uh, despite the difficulties that we are in, once the ember months come, uh, then we are likely we're going to see inflation going higher because of the demand. People will overstretch themselves in order to make sure that they have a good, festive uh, occasion. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at, because they're saying um, it might just rise up to 30% um, by December. So right now I think it's about 28%. So there might just be a 2% increase but i know nigerians were passionate people especially when it comes to um something that is being celebrated so if you're a muslim of course you want to celebrate salah if you're a christian you want to celebrate christmas um and then even going into the new year everyone is happy going into the new year and you just have to celebrate or spend but what's going to happen to the spending power of nigerians the purchasing power of nigerians maybe leading up to uh, the new year What's going to happen? What do we? Ex what are we going to expect? Especially with the fact that, of course, fuel is at an all-time high. We've seen electricity subsidy. There are so many things that are happening in our economic sector. But what's what? What can we see by January? You see that our spending, uh, uh, this thing will go down. Uh, besides, you know, our needs, you know, uh, for the festive things, uh, they are predicting that uh, probably fuel will go higher again, there will mm -hmm. be increase. So the purchasing power of people will go down as, uh, you know, uh, the Naira keeps, keeps on the getting devalued. So there are a lot of things that will now weaken the purchasing power of the people. And uh, like I said, despite this, you see people trying to stretch over stretch themselves in order to uh, you know cope up with the festive uh, time or period and you know within the festive period it's not just eating and the merry making but it's also a period of uh, giving gifts yes. so people will want up all these things you know uh, that will now uh, you know put them uh, we usually said in in my a language, you know, when the sadler comes, past, you know, people, they say the, the Polish person will borrow money and uh, in order to mm -hmm. to survive uh, the sadler. And then after the sadler, he will be running hectares, keta in order to, uh, you know, pay the debt. So we are going to see the purchasing of power, the purchasing power of people to definitely go down, especially given the you know, increase in inflation, the devaluation of the Naira, and the increase in fuel, and other things. So uh, it will be a very hectic time, very difficult time for Nigerians. Mm. 
Well, difficult times ahead. We hope that everyone can brace up for it and, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll still be okay. We'll still be okay regardless of all of the things that are happening with our economy. But one thing I must say is no one should borrow just because you want to spend and celebrate the festive period. I don't think, I don't think that is necessary at all. And I think at this point, every Nigerian needs to start to prioritize their own expenses. So you need to know what is necessary, what you can do without, and know that, you know, next year is still going to come and we're still going to have a long time to brace up with all of the things that we're seeing at the moment with our economy. But let's look at another story here that says MPC meeting. Experts warn against further interest rate hikes. So, of course, um, we're seeing that there might just be another interest rate um, hike, but on the punch, it says MPC may lower interest rate on Tuesday. What are you expecting with this? Do you think interest rates will be higher? And what is going to be the impact on our economy? Um, or do you think it will be lower? And would it be better as well? You see, if, if it is a wish, we would want it to be lower. By given the practice, whenever the NPC meets, um, they come up with, uh, you know, increase, and they will justify that this is the way to bring down inflation and other things. In other words, they tend to defy uh, and uh, reject all sort of uh, appeal from, you know, experts, but they will sit down and do it. So... If we have to go by the historical pattern, I don't think they will reduce it. Probably they will increase it, uh, given what they have been doing in the past. But like I said, if it is our own wish, Nigerians will want it to come down so that at least that will now, uh, you know, allow you know investors to borrow then if they borrow they may invest it and that will now you know uh, bring down inflation but in their own case they look at it in another way so the simplest economic rule that uh, you bring down inflation when you have this uh, interest rate uh, low and their own i see is different i don't know where they have the rule i mean the law but at least um uh, they should have learned from lesson uh, from our own history that they consistently uh, keep on increasing the interest rate. And whenever they do, inflation goes up. So I think this time uh, I will join the expert and ask them and say, please don't uh, raise it. Uh, this is what Nigerians are expecting. Hmm. Well, um, I mean, raising it, of course, we, I think at this point we've gone through a lot. <laughs> and we just expect the government to understand, be empathetic towards us, towards what we're facing. But we don't know what's going to happen, and we're just going to look forward to seeing how it will unravel. All right, I want to take another story here. It says, um, VAT payment, federal government earns more in seven months as Nigerians battle rising costs. So we're seeing um, Nigerians continue to grapple with you know, the rising cost, the inflation, um, subsidy removal, electricity tariff. But then with the VAT payment, the federal government is still in the business of making more money. What's your take on that? Yeah, you see, that is what should not, that should not be the business of a government. The business of government, ideally, should be to improve the welfare, the living standard of uh, people. Right. But now, uh, the philosophy of governance has changed. Uh, our government seems to, uh, you know, to count its own success or gain in terms of the IGR that it is able to generate. Okay, so that is why the government will be smiling that they have raised, uh, they, they have earned so, so amount of money from that. And, but at the expense of the citizenry, okay? And secondly, they don't see the, you know, linkage between this but uh, with uh, unemployment, with inflation, and with the collapse of industries and so on. Because the more you tax, you know, the more you now are pushing investors out of uh, business, especially given the fact that this VAT is from domestic, not from foreign, not imported uh, uh, material, but from our own domestics. And so it is a double jeopardy, actually. The government is 
going home, you know, smiling that they get more money out of the BAT, but actually they don't see the a chain of effect that uh, this BAT is created, like I said, issue of unemployment, issue of, uh, you know, collapsing of uh, industries, yeah. the issue of uh, inflation and other things. And all these things also will add up to issue of insecurity. So I think this is where the government needs to look in and see how uh, it should go down, you know, cut down that VAT, like the way other taxes, and, uh, you know, also tax, uh, cut uh, issue of uh, spending, you know, on governance and so on. So as at least they can bring down, uh, you know, the inflation and bring soccer to Nigerians. Well, rightly said, bring soccer to Nigerians. Um, even if it's a tax rebate, you know, there should just be something that you're doing for the people, understanding the hardship that is going on now and saying, how can we be better for Nigerians? What can we do um, that would help the situation at the moment? And I think it's not just about giving rice because a lot of times people are now saying anything that happens is always rice, is always palliatives. But if you're putting policies that would actually benefit Nigerians, then that would just work better while we're still trying to figure out how to get out of this crisis that we're in now with our economy. All right, let me take the final one on the business NJ. It says, Labor leader vows to engage federal government on minimum wage, decries betrayal by president. What's your take on this when you saw this story? So um, uh, there is the say, there's a rumor um, allegedly that says the president, um, the labor leaders have been betrayed by the president. And of course, we know what the minimum wage is now. Still, it's not enough for families or for people to put food on their table. But I want to get your take on this one. Yeah, you see, the, the labor leaders come out and say that there was a betrayal uh, because when they were negotiating the uh, minimum wage, um, they went to uh, 250000 And according to them, the president said he can give them that uh, amount, but he's going to raise the uh, petroleum price. Mm -hmm. So the other take the minimum below that one and then there will be no increase in in, in fuel mm -hmm. uh, and um, they said they took it and uh, now the government has increased uh, uh, the fuel price. Okay. So that is why they are saying there is betrayal. And this, I think, it has been for quite some time now, over three weeks, that they are saying the same issue. But whatever it is, I think the government has to be, you know, uh, humanistic. Because one, they know that even 70,000 is not enough. Even if it is an ordinary person, let's assume a single person who is not married but is working, if you give him 70,000 in a month, how much will it take him to eat? Even if he's going to take, uh, let's say, three naira by pass, three square meal, that will be 90,000, even on food. Let's talk less of uh, uh, rent, uh, of transportation, of health, and maybe school fees and other needs, closing. So this uh, 70,000 is unrealistic. But to me, I think the issue is not about 70,000, but the issue is that the government should look at you know, how do we now create a very conducive atmosphere so that things will be affordable, living standard will be affordable. Everywhere in the world, governments try to take their people out of poverty. But in our own case, the policies we are uh, pursuing are taking the people more deeper into poverty. So I think we should, there is need for rethink in yeah. our policy in order to stabilize the system. I agree with you. I agree with you fully. All right, let's move over to the punch. The punch leads with a dope poll. PDP alleges rigging as APC Okwebolo wins. The writers here says PDP governors insist candidates won. Obasaki vows to seek redress. Igodalo rejects results. Another writer says Tinubu congratulates Okwebolo as Akwabio Oshomole Shoaibu so APC supporters jubilate. Um, well, the numbers here says APC polled 
291,667 votes, PDP polled 247,274 votes, and the Labour Party polled um, 22,763 votes. I want to get your take on, you know, the whole elect electoral system that happened over the weekend in Edo State. Do you think that INEC did their best job so far? No, I don't. I don't think they did. Um, actually, if you read between the line, on the surface, yes, uh, there is a peaceful election, right. uh, and that uh, secondly, they are able to conduct the election, collect everything, and come up with a result in time within a day. All these things on the surface of it will look at uh, it as if uh, everything is okay. But if you are a keen looker. Uh, you see that there are a lot of problems. One, let's take the total number of votes that are cast. If you take this one, it's about 200, maybe you put it 250, this one 200 and something. By the time you add, everything is less than perhaps a million or 500,000 or less than that. This is telling, that this should tell the leaders that Nigerians are disenchanted. Why are you have such a very, very low, very low turnout in terms of election? There is something. This is what we call voter protest. People are protesting that they are not happy with the system as a whole. So the government and the leaders and the, the, the election uh, umpires should do something to now raise the confidence and trust of people in, in the process. That is number one. Number two, if you look at um, what happened before the election and during the elections, okay, you see that the election has been returned like a warfare. Instead of a democratic system where people pre of it, where they will freely go and choose their own leaders, imagine the number of security agencies that are agents that are put there. Police say they, they have deployed thirty-five thousand men, and uh, other security agents uh, eight thousand plus, and there's a mil also military. So by the time you put everything together, about uh, 50,000 security agencies uh, agents are put in the place. It is, this is not a warfare. It's supposed to be an election where people will go. And uh, it's telling us that there is a problem. And the sad problem that uh, one has to look at is that uh, people from outside of uh, Edo uh, were the people who determine everything. Governors from PDP come in, and governors from APC and big uh, government shots and other things were all there. Instead of allowing the people of Edo to really determine who governs them. So I think it is something. And the most important part uh, by that we have to worry is the self-delusion that the election has given to the leaders. Already the president has come out saying that it is an endorsement of his uh, policy, that people are supporting his reform policies and other things. Which is, uh, you know, you, uh, is just saying, you know, underrating the intelligence of Nigeria. Nobody, I think, in Nigeria is happy with this uh, economic crisis. Mm. So ideally, election is supposed to be a means by which people tell their leaders that they either approve their policies or they reject their policies. So by the time we are uh, uh, getting a cooked uh, election, and uh, these things, and the worst part of it, the last thing is that if you look at a do election, it's a typical rat race of who out with the other. So the outcome is not just a pre and fair election, but it's more of who out the other, that is what is coming. Right from the election, we know how the tense, uh, how tense it was, and how each side was saying they must win. It is a do affair and other things. So I think this is uh, highly uh, anti-democracy. Uh, the way the election went on in uh, Edo, and probably on door two is coming, and other things. And I think we are going to see the trend like that. Hmm. 
Well, with our electoral system, we just expect a little bit more from them. We expect a little bit more from INEC. Um, one of the things that you also mentioned was the low turnout of voters. Um, and of course, uh, better rigor. I mean, there was a lot that went on on social media this weekend about the Edo elections. But we'll be talking about it much later in the show. So we're just going to move over now. And then there's another story here on um, the punch that says, fresh tariff hike looms as monthly pass subsidy hits. 181 billion naira. So we're looking at another another tariff hike again. We know that, you know, I think about 300% was increased um, for Band A customers. But what's going to happen now? Because we're talking about the spending power, you know, the purchasing power for Nigerians. We're talking about all that we have to endure. And if there's still going to be a... I mean, fuel is going to be increased about a thousand naira, or if some people are even paying over a thousand naira. If there's still going to be another tariff hike for electricity, do you think this might just, you know, drive people up against the wall? And what are we going to expect? What's going to be the response of Nigerians to the government? Yeah, you see, it is pushing the people against the wall because it is not this, uh, you know, the government is spent, is getting more and more money like the way we talk about but like uh, uh and other things you know uh, the the interest rate and now with uh, you know tariff uh, already you have it on oil and they are saying the oil maybe uh, they are going to increase it so with all these things it is going to make us uh, life much more difficult for nigerians and uh it is going to have uh, to increase the rate of inflation, and it is going to raise uh, the, uh, to increase the rate of economic uh, 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 crisis. Because the more you make a production expensive, the more you know uh, factories and businesses collapse. Some will migrate. That what that is what I see. Some um, live in Nigeria, closing shop and go to other places like mm -hmm. Ghana and other places. And those that are indigenous, they uh, pulled off. So with all these things, you are now creating mountains of economic problem. And with that, it is also social problem. And uh, it is de going to degenerate into political problem. Because by the time you are telling people, you know, uh, 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 tighten your belt, uh, fasten your mm -hmm. belt, be this, uh, but the government is not willing to take, uh, by, to lead by example. The leaders are not. They are spending huge on these things, uh, you know. So this will make it difficult, and it will push the people against all. And it is dangerous by the time people uh, decide to come. So that is why many opinion leaders or makers are saying, or opinion leaders are saying that uh, we are living on a keg of gunpowder. It is a time bomb which the government and the leaders have to. I take into consideration because these policies actually are impoverishing Nigeria the more and uh, the more you put you put the people against the wall and that is this and there is a common saying that a hungry person is an angry person mm -hmm. already people are hungry and you are pushing them down and the ones it uh, transform into anger uh, it is going to be explosive well, we hope it doesn't even get to that because, I mean, we saw what happened with the end bad governance protests and, you know, how it was being hijacked at some points, you know, um, even in Kanu states and some other parts of the country. So we hope that they're not just going to push people up against the wall and then they have to respond with violence. We hope that the policies that they're going to put in place are going to be the ones that would, you know, help with the welfare of Nigerians because that is the primary responsibility of the government to ensure the welfare welfare for the people and we hope they're going to do just that. Another um, story here says PDP crisis, Atiku Bax, anti-Damagom um, NWC members. What do you think about this? I know there's been a little bit of ruckus um, with this, but now we're even seeing the um, presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party backing um, the anti-Damagom um, NWC members. You see, the, the crisis in PDP um, is, is a long, uh, has a long history, but the, what is happening now is a calculation of two, two, 2027. Damagun 
and uh, Atiku are from northeast. And by the PDP policy of, you know, rotation, uh, if Damagun remains the party chairman, automatically, uh, you know, Atiku will have a very tax and big tax of uh, getting the ticket once more for, uh, you know, a, 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 presidential, a presidential ticket. So that is why there is that calculation. And Damagun, too, is now looking at that, so he is backing Wiki, uh, the Amagun faction are backing Wiki faction, so that at least if somebody from South come in, the Amagun will still remain the party chairman. So that is why there is this. One has to look at uh, the you know the political calculations in terms of 2027. That is why they are having uh, this dilly and dilly dally. The PDP ought to know that uh, since it lost power uh, in 2015, it has failed to now gather itself together and work as a vibrant opposition party. Secondly, it has failed to you know, unite all the various elements and uh, it allowed itself currently. And in fact, that is what also contributed to with their own Pelua in Edo, because they went there divided about five key people, you know, were, you know, fighting themselves in uh, within PDP. So it is the same thing. Everywhere uh, they go, if they are divided, the party will gradually uh, lose election. And if it continues failing election, uh, the, the, the future of the party is even at stake. Well, we hope they get their house in order because for us to have a good opposition party um, that is always going to put the ruling party on their toes, you need to just make sure that everything, your house is in order and you can have that formidable force, really. So we hope that they do that. So they ensure that whatever rockers they're having in the PDP, I, I know that with every political party, there's always fa um, factions and all of that, but it's important that you come together um, as swiftly as possible possible to have that formidable force. All right, so let's look at but, another... But the, but, the, but the ruling party will not allow it to happen. Mm. So that is why they are backing Wiki and other things also, so that uh, they, they will still, uh, you know, uh, cripple the opposition. Mm. Well, but I, I mean, I, I would think that there should be some form of common sense to that. If you know that, you know, the, the opposition party is trying as much as possible to sabotage your own party, then you have to come together. And anyone who is doing, um, um, you know, cross capitain anti-party activities, they should be sanctioned for that, don't you think? Yeah, they should do it, but that is why you have politics of ideas. These are politics of, you know, cash and carry. People are there to make money. So irrespective of whether their party is in office or not, uh, provided they will get it uh, from the other side. So that is why you have peace columnists in the party. They will be working for the party in government, and uh, they will be feeling their decision. This is because it is not a politics of principle. It is not a politics of idea. So that is why we are seeing this, and we will continue to see it so long as our uh, politics is self-serving uh, industry. Mm. Oh, well, so let's move over to another story, um, just as we quickly rush through this. So it says, one year after, Tinubu yet to appoint ambassadors for 109 embassies. Um, well, it's been over a year. A lot of people are saying that we do not even have the, um, we lack formal representation when it comes to the global stage. So, of course, each of our embassies um, should have our own legal, our own formal representation. But we're not seeing that here. Why do you think it's taking so long for the for the president to appoint um, ambassadors for this to ensure that we have that capacity where we can represent ourselves? Where we can even have that better international relations with other countries? Yeah, you see a lot of reasons. One is the fact that um, uh, the, the politicians are more concerned with internal domestic politics. Mm. Uh, secondly, it's the wrangling, you know. Uh, everybody, each camp is trying to now have its own uh, candidate. So there is a lot of pressure. There are a lot of pressures here and there for who get to what. And uh, thirdly, is because uh, we don't give much attention 
to such things. You know, uh, little do we pay attention on on the issue of representation outside. Otherwise, you see, you cannot stay uh, um, over a year without having representatives in outside. You now allow the it may be the head, I mean, the leading person to represent Nigeria. I remember there was a time we went to France, you know, doing work for the National Assembly. The politicians joined, uh, you know, they put their name, they collected the Esther code, but we are allowed to be there instead. So the, the ambassador then has to make us like we are. Uh, senators representing Nigeria. So I think it's, uh, you know, this is the way we make, uh, we take things for granted. You know, we don't put much emphasis. We don't see the linkage between good international relationships with uh, your, our domestic politics. We pay too much attention on this at the expense of others. So that is why the, the government doesn't seem to be much in a hurry uh, to appoint uh, ambassadors. Well, um, I'm, I want to look at um, the Daily Trust. So, of course, the Daily Trust leads with the election that happened over the weekend. But I want to look at this story at the bottom that says petrol is 52 naira per liter in Libya. And just to give you a little bit of context. Now, of course, we know that Libya is rich in oil. In fact, it has um, the largest reserve in Africa. Here it says that Libya has proven reserves equivalent to 594.2 times its annual consumption. And that means that without net exports, Libya would be about 594 years of oil theft at current consumption levels and excluding unproven reserves. Now, compared, if you put that side by side with Nigeria, Libya has the highest amount of crude oil reserves in the continent with about 48.4 billion barrels, while Nigerian reserves amounted to about 36.9 billion barrels. So, of course, if you even look at it, it's, it's, it's a little more, right? We're looking at um, about 8 or rather 12 um, 12 more billion barrels. But we're seeing the price that is being reflected in Libya at 52 naira per liter, if you're going to, you know, convert that into Nigerian naira. But Nigeria, we're paying over almost a thousand naira, over 800 naira for fuel. And we are two countries that produce oil. We're two countries that are rich in these natural resources, but we're seeing the difference. Does it mean that we're not managing our own resources as expected? Because if we can see our other counterparts, they're doing better. And of course, the lives of their, of their citizens are better with the pricing. But what do you think we need to do better with Nigeria? Like, how can we make sure that we're harnessing our resources and then it reflects on the lives of the citizens? Now, you see, a lot of things uh, explain the difference between Libya and us. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind that presently Libya is almost a failed state. It is in a state of crisis. Yeah. But despite that failed nature, uh, this is how much it costs to have uh, petroleum. Uh, the reason for the difference is, one, uh, the issue of management. Okay? Mm -hmm. You see, our own, uh, we manage our own resources rather badly. Secondly, is the issue of corruption, okay? Uh, you know, the corruption around, surrounding, uh, you know, the, the, the whole industries. Now, for example, with Nangote, uh, some people have done the calculation. If you take all the other monies that come with landing costs, petroleum will be less than 500 naira uh, in Nigeria. But because of corruption, uh, people are adding that one. And uh, the third uh, factor is what I said uh, earlier on about the priority, the, 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 the policy of government. There, they see the government, the main responsibility of the government is the welfare of the people. But here, our own philosophy is more income that we generate, more IGR. So the government doesn't care much about the the welfare of the people, uh, they put more emphasis on uh, how well, how much they de generate. So that is why you see taxation here, increase here, removal of subsidy there, and so on, that we have talked even today. Uh, just 
because the government wants to generate more money. And, uh, and uh, sadly or fortunately, is because we now put emphasis on infrastructural development more than human development. You see, the government is always saying we, gener we get money and invest on infrastructure. While they know uh, that infrastructure and uh, IGR are all means, they are not the end of the government. The end of the government is welfare of the citizens. Mm -hmm. But here we are, so we are making the means to be the end, and we are ignoring the actual end. But in Libya, they put that priority that it is people welfare, so that is why their resources are invested, and the more they get... Um, the more they invest on human development. Well, we hope that, you know, the welfare of the people would be the priority of the government because that is just what their own responsibility is to become a leader of a nation. And so we hope that they start to look into that and do their jobs right. Anyways, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Professor Camillo, we want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Same to you. Yes, sir. All right, I've been speaking with Professor Camillo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, joining us from Kanu. And we've just been taking the global stories that made it to the front pages of our national dailies. We'll go on a short break now. When we return, we'll be reviewing the papers. Well, rather, we just reviewed the papers. When we return, we'll be looking at our hot topic, which talks about everything that has happened over the weekend with the Edo State elections. Please stay with us.